Sometimes you may have everything, you may have whatever it takes, you may have the skills, you may have the education, you may have everything, but then if you don't have the connection, it might be a little challenging for you for you to get in. And the connection can easily be built. It just it could just come as easy as sending an email to a World Bank staff or a UN staff or an IMF staff. And then start introducing yourself that if you have any opportunities, I'm willing to even volunteer to work to work with you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Nimdia Talk. I'm so happy that you are able to join us today. I hope your summer is going pretty well. I was very privileged to have a conversation with my friend, Dr. Kofi Berma Diadako of the World Bank, and he had very, very insightful thoughts and perspectives on his work. He gave some professional tips and also shared some insights into his expectations for the future. Please join me as together we have a conversation with my friend, Dr. Kofi Adiaberma Dako. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of our podcast. I'm really happy that you can join us today. Today, we are very privileged to have a very important <laughs> guest um, to join us to talk about something that I think is interesting to a lot of our very regular listeners. Um, we are happy to have um, our guest. I will let him introduce himself. Um, hi, I'm our friend. How are you? Who do we have on today? Um, thank you very much, Albert, for having me. My name is Francis Adiadako. I'm currently a young professional with the World Bank. I work with the Food and Agriculture Global Practice, focusing on South Asia region, uh, mainly working on India and Sri Lanka. And uh, proud to join in um, the Agriculture GP, I was with the Poverty GP um, in the Indonesia country office of the World Bank. All right. Well, thank you, Francis. I'm really happy that you can um, join us today. Um, it's very interesting when when we see um, the World Bank from from the outside, we think of it as a as a almost like an octopus, and that's a, like a huge global organization. H- how is it like? Um, working at the World Bank. Uh, it might it might be quite interesting. Yeah, you know, um, the World Bank has been my dream job in growing up. So um, particularly when I was in college, I got an interest in working with the World Bank. And um, so working with the World Bank, let me talk briefly about that. It is it's a very exciting place to work, particularly if you are you are a development you know, uh, expert or somebody who's interested in development work. Uh, mainly for two reasons. The first part is, um, you know, the World Bank work has has two components. The first one is um, project implementation and project management, where we provide loans to government and then we help them to implement these uh, projects. And then the second part is uh, focuses on analytical work. Mainly, the analytical work um, helps to to define the projects that we want to implement and also evaluate the the projects. And then eventually also look at the impacts of the project. So every other thing that we work, you know, falls under these two big umbrellas. Mm. Oh, th- that's very insightful. And I, I I observed when you were talking that you mentioned that uh, working at the World Bank was your childhood dream. Um, w- would you want to talk to us a, a little bit about your childhood? I mean, to, to dream of working in the World Bank you must have come from a very um, privileged background. Is that is that the case? Can you talk to us a little bit about your childhood, if if you don't mind? Yeah, thanks, Albert. So it's actually right on the contrary. I I grew up in the village in Ghana, in the in the KJB district of the Oti region of Ghana. So I, I grew up with, with my grandmother in the farming community, and that community had mainly uh, we had about um, let me say about. The time I was growing up, they have about 500 people where, you know, it's a small community, so everybody knows everybody. Like, I can see, I can meet somebody on the street and tell the person's history from the time the person was born. That is if I'm older than the person. And anybody who's older than me can also tell my history because it's a very closely knit um, community. And uh, uh, one key thing about that place is uh, it's a poverty stricken place in the sense that if people wake up and, and they don't go to the farm, they wouldn't be able to, to have food and food on the table for that day. You know, some people even survive without any money on them. All they depend on is their farm produce. 
So um, growing up in that in that environment, I got a first hand experience of what poverty is like. And then I also see people um, people having a, a huge talents, like you know, people who do well in school, people who who have very uh, unique sports um, expertise, but then they are not able to develop those because of poverty. You know, because um, let me give an instance. When I was uh, um, in my junior high school, there was this guy called um, Ronaldo. You know, he was he basically called himself after the Brazilian Ronaldo. At the time, yeah. because he was very good in soccer, he could stand at one end of the pitch and shoot the ball to score at the other end. That's how good he was. Yeah. But then because of poverty, this guy couldn't even go into any team in the city to play because his parents couldn't afford. That's a huge talent that was wasted. And then uh, in my class, out of uh, 35 people, only uh, five of us were able to go to high school from that place. Not because the students are not good, but because they were their parents were too poor to take them even to high school, let alone going to college. So growing up in such an environment, um, I got a first-hand experience of what poverty is like. And so when I got into the university and I was looking for a program to, to major in, I, I focused on agricultural economics because I think uh, it has um, direct links to, to, to poverty in the, in the sense that I saw that as uh, a channel, so that link sort of uh, agriculture, and also how the economy operates, you know. So yeah. focusing on that area, I was able to I was able to get a better understanding of how of how the economy works, and then uh, how that how agriculture can be used to liberate people out of poverty. So basically, growing up in that village uh, gave me um, a, a sense of how you know I can help my people to to come out of poverty using the skills that I acquired in school. That, that's very interesting. So um, I, I think I think that's that's very impactful in the sense that that environment, you know, shaped you. Um, it seems like it shaped you very very significantly. Do you think that um, that was was also the motivation to pursue a career in international development? Or if I could flip the question the other way, at what point? Um, at what point did you realize that a career in international development was what you wanted to do? So um, thanks, Albert. I actually um, got the point was actually uh, when I was uh, I was in college, my my final year in college. You know, um, I attended University of Ghana, and then University of Ghana, I majored in agriculture, and then the final year, I decided to major in agricultural economics. And the one reason why I, I, I decided to major in that is, uh, you know, given the background that I, I already talked about, there was a time I, I traveled from my village to, to Accra, which is the city. And then I, I began to observe significant differences, you know, between life in the village and life in Accra. You know, when, when, you, are, when you live in a particular area and you don't have access to news and all, you, you might think that is what the world has. You know, there's nothing else to compare to. But then as you move from um, that place to, to a little more developed place, you begin to see the differences. You know, for, for instance, in my village, there was no electricity, but then you come to Accra and then there was electricity. There was no water flowing like in taps, but you come to Accra, right in your house, you know, the, the tap is free. You just have to turn it on and the water will be flowing from it. So um, I observed that and then I began, I, I began asking myself questions. Why is it that um, the people in my village are so poor, but those in the city are, are richer. Mm -hmm. Then when I majored in agricultural economics, I also got a chance to go to, to Japan for an excellent program. And that, that gave me you know, um, a very broad overview of, of, of the differences that exist between, between, between nations. You know, like moving from a village to the city, I saw the differences between cities in terms of development. And then moving from Ghana to, to, to Japan, I also saw the major differences in terms of uh, development. So I observed, I started asking myself these questions. Why are some people poor? And why are some countries poor? A country like Ghana, why is it so poor compared to a country like Japan? So when I started asking myself these questions, it, it gave me a, a lot more interest, you know, in um, agricultural economics. And then I decided to 
go to i decided to major in that for my for, for my graduate school so if you ask about the point that actually gave me an interest in international development i would say that it is my years in college and then as i go into grad school it deepened my understanding of the issues and then I began to basically understand the differences between nations, why some nations are poor and others are rich, why some communities are poor and others are rich. And I, I develop a lot of interest in that. That's what actually pushed me into development, international development. Okay, and thank you very much. I, I think that sort of the, the, the tripartite, if I could say that the tripartite perspective that you offer from, from your, little, your little village to Accra to Japan and sort of the different the different grades of development that that you experience drives home that question that you, you were trying how why are some people at this level and others are not um, you made a point about the decision to go to grad school so you completed your, your college education at the university of ghana and then you decided to go to grad school um, looking back how important was that decision um, in helping you achieve your objective of working in international development? How important was that decision? Yeah, so I, I think it is very important um, for one main reason. Yeah, you know, international development is, um, like I mentioned, and it's not only unique to the World Bank, it's unique to other international organizations that are into development. There is a huge component of it that focuses on analytical work. And then to be able to do that kind of analytical work, you need graduate education. You know, you, you need to, if an economist, you, you need to, to, to get deep understanding of the micro macro theories. You need to get a deep understanding of economic models and how they operate. You need a deep understanding of econometrics, you know, how to use data to, um, how to analyze data using statistical packages and econometrics tools to be able to come up with policies, you know, to help governments. And then you also need, um, writing and communication skills and these are skills that um, I mean undergraduate education is good but then you need a graduate education to be able to build these extra skills you not know, right. to be able to make international development. Okay where did you do grad school and how, how did that shape you in, in that regard? Uh, so I did my graduate education at Purdue University in the Indiana in the United States so I um, what one, one one reason why I I chose that school which, is that, uh, which town is that you know, which village so you move from a village to Ghana <laughs> to another village in Indiana well, <laughs> that is very interesting you know <laughs> let, let me probably share this story the first time I got to, <laughs> I got to Indiana I was moving <laughs> I, I mean as I was moving from the airport to to campus we we're just you know driving through cornfields. So I, I was asking myself this question, am I really in America or I'm still back in my village? I thought I was dreaming. But then <laughs> going to campus and seeing what is there, I realized, no, this is not in my village. It is America. Yeah. It is. Yeah, so <laughs> going back to your earlier question, Albert. Yeah. So um, grad school, I, I decided to go to grad school because um, I, I think it is it, it is very important. I saw it very important for my for my graduate, uh, I mean, for my for my career, the career, the kind of career that I invested, I invested for myself in international development. So back in grad school, I was able to build all the skills that I need, the analysis of data, you know, using statistical packages to come up with results, and then interpreting those results to come up with policy. Another thing also is in the area of communication. You know, you may know everything, but if you're unable to communicate that to to whoever is listening to you. You might not be able to to achieve any impact so i learned a lot about how to write well how to write research papers how to write reports you know focus which areas to focus on to be able to get the, the, the traction that is needed for policies to be to be made and then i also learned how to you know verbally carry my my conversation my my ideas across to people because it is one thing having a chat with a friend and another thing communicating for people to Take you seriously, particularly when it comes to the area of international development. I mean, not only international development, but different aspects of life. You need to be able to communicate to all for the person that you are communicating to to understand you. And then the language that we speak in the international development field is uh, most of the time leaning towards policy. So yeah. how do you convey your message? You know, how do you convey your, your research work? How do you convey your reports? You know, in uh, verbally to to whoever is listening to you for them to be able to make important decisions about the development of nations. Good, um, thank you. That, that, was, that was very well said. Um, so 
And I, I'm thinking, I'm standing perhaps hypothetically in the shoes of somebody who has similar aspirations, has just finished um, his PhD or master's degree, and is really hoping to make that make that transition. Um, looking back at your own experience, what, what are some of the things that you think worked for you um, and perhaps things that well that you could have done better in terms of the transition from um, your grad education, you have completed a PhD and then moving into international development work with with the with the World Bank. What 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 worked for you? Were you um, one of the few lucky ones? Like what 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 worked for you looking back um, at, at your transition from grad school into the international development world? Um, what what worked for me, Albert? I'll say is um, I'll, I'll focus it on let's say about three things. So, so the first one, the first one is um, I mean I'm, I'm not saying this in a braggadocious way, but then it is more about um, my my strength in economic theory. Mm -hmm. You know because um, like I mentioned earlier, or like I keep mentioning, some of the work that we do or half of the work that we do focuses on analytical work. You know, to be able to do strong analytical work, you need to have a strong understanding of of um, of the economic models, of how the economy works, e either at the macro level or at the micro level or anything in between. You need to understand how things are linked. For instance, how agriculture is linked to to national development, how the energy sector is linked to international development, how um, how let's say the environment mm -hmm. is linked to national development, how different aspects of the economy are linked together. And because if you formulate one policy in a particular area, you need to look at the effect that it's going to have on other, other areas of the economy. So you basically have to have a broad understanding and a strong understanding of how the economy operates. You know, so I, I think that, that is one of the, the 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 key things that helped me. And then the second thing um, I, I, I think in my view is is about uh, reading. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was in grad school, I, I spent a good amount of time reading about the, the development in general. Mm -hmm. You know, my area of specialty when I was in grad school was the linkages between poverty and uh, agriculture. Basically, how agriculture can be used to lift poverty out of how agriculture can be used to lift poor people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. And then um, to Aside that, I was also reading about how things work in other sectors. Mm -hmm. you know, so that because when, whenever you're talking to somebody, um, somebody like a development expert, they are not only looking at one angle of, of the economy. They want you to be able to have a deep, a good understanding of different aspects of it. And that comes only by reading, mm -hmm. you know, because um, reading about what you are doing and also reading about different areas. And then the third thing that I think helped me also is my writing skills. Mm -hmm. I took I took very strong interest in improving my writing. At, at some point when I graduated from my college, I realized I needed to improve a lot. So I spent a good amount of time in grad school reading books on writing, reading research articles to know how to write better. Like I said, I mentioned earlier, no matter how good you are, if I'm able to communicate that well, you know, people wouldn't take you seriously. And one of the key ways of communicating is, is, is by writing. And we write a lot, we write reports, we write uh, research papers, we write uh, project documents. And uh, so I, I, reading a lot and also um, learning how to write well, um, helped me to to get to where I am now. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's very interesting. And I I I saw the um, I could I could understand the um, the systems perspective that you keep going you keep going back to. Um, when when you moved to when you started off at the World Bank, I I. I think you mentioned in your intro that you had work outside outside the US. How how was that experience? What 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 type of skills or what type of exposures did you did you encounter working sort of outside the US? And what what type of work did you do there? Yeah, so um, I was referring to my work in Indonesia. That oh. happened right after I graduated from grad school. I went I I, I got a job with the World Bank in the Indonesia country office. And then um, in Indonesia, the English is not their first language. Right. Uh, they have their own language called the Indonesian language. Only a few people could speak English. So that was 
when I when I first got a job, that was one of the challenges that I had. Or uh, one that was one of the things that I was thinking about. That how do I go to a country, you know, that does not speak English very very much. You know, they have their own language. So how 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 would I be able to navigate through the system? But then uh, one thing that that helped me a lot in that at uh, that place is the fact that um, I was uh, I was able to to basically make friends with my coworkers at the early stages to learn about how to navigate in the in the country like learn a few words and then also learn not just a few words well initially I, I learned a few words and then at some point I, I began learning the language in, in detail so that I'll be able to communicate well with people and then um, in the country um, one thing that that I or that I benefited from is the fact that we got to deal directly with government officials you know because if you're based in the Washington office unless you travel there which happens um, once in a while but then if you are based in the country office on almost week uh, on on nearly weekly basis you go to the government office to have interactions with them basically telling them about what, what you are doing and how best that can be helpful to them and then uh, for instance there was this work that i did on the impact of uh, fiscal policy on poverty and income inequality looking at how taxes and transfers can can be used to to liberate people out of poverty mm -hmm. so we, you realize that as you you sit in your office and work on this when you, when you start communicating with, with the with the client that's the government officials you realize that they have they have because they have implemented these policies they have very good understanding you know of, of how things work so the more you communicate with them the more you're able to refine your work and then eventually when you present the work to them they'll be very happy with it so one of the things that i i i learned very much or i i benefited from so much is the communication with 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 the clients yeah yeah okay um and you said that you um were able to learn the language um, in indonesia and um, in the interest of our listeners from jakarta would you can you say maybe hello to them or something just just so to practice your language skills <laughs> uh, this is very interesting <laughs> yeah so uh, you know like having 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 stayed away from 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 indonesia for nearly two years i'm yeah. beginning to forget almost 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 everything but i mean i can just say um Silicon, uh Francis this yeah some meaning uh, please go ahead this is Francis you know something oh, like okay. that yeah. okay okay <laughs> I, I don't speak the language so I'll trust on your integrity so well that's very interesting um Francis um I, I think that what you have talked about today is really really important because I know a lot of young people young Africans and non young Africans who have interest and they think of um, dreaming about working in, in, in at the international level and some may think that those dreams are they are too lofty um, some may think they are dreaming they are, they are thinking of perhaps overachieving if they think of working in the international um, arena with working with very very big organizations like the World Bank. What what would be your advice for for people who are thinking of following the same path like you? Um, what would be your advice for them? So um, one main advice, uh, if I can use some of your words, one main advice is that um, they shouldn't think of it as uh, that they're overachieving, <laughs> because I mean there's nothing that is beyond you as long as you're able to plan and, and do the right things you know so i, I think uh, if, if, you're, if you're willing to put in the hard work you'll be able to get into it and uh, one advice that i'll apart from that one advice that i'll give is just have have um, have a plan you know no go to the world bank's website or go to any international organization's website that is into development look at the skill set that they are looking for and then build yourself accordingly for instance, if you are an economist and then you currently have an undergraduate, what, what you need to do to know is that usually when these jobs are advertised, they want somebody with at least a master's. Mm -hmm. So th that means that you have to plan as part of your planning, you have to you, you have to plan on getting a master's. And right. then after that, if 
you want to get into the research part of it, then you also have to, you know that you have to get a PhD. And then whilst you're getting the PhD, you need also to be reading about, I mean, whilst you're in grad school, you need to be reading about, you know, the kind of areas that this international organization focuses on, you know, mainly in the area of poverty alleviation and uh, income inequality. So that if when you are uh, planning your, your research, you have an element or a component of that, you know, as part of your dissertation or thesis. Because uh, once you have that, you are able to speak the kind of language that they speak, you know, in terms of uh, the kind of research that they do and how those policy implications are derived from that. So once you are able to, you know, to have this plan that I'm going to get a master's, I'm going to get a, maybe a PhD if there's a need for that. And then I know the kind of area that they work on. And then you make the right connections. You know, sometimes you may have everything, you, you may have whatever it takes, you may have the skills, you may have the education, you may have everything. But then if you don't have the connection, it might be a little challenging for you for you to get in. And the connection can easily be built. It just it could just come as easy as sending an email to a World Bank staff or a UN staff or an IMF staff. And then start introducing yourself that if you have any opportunities, I'm willing to even volunteer to work to work with you. Um, let me let me give this instance. The first time I worked on a, on a World Bank uh, project as a consultant, it was actually my professor who knew somebody within the World Bank and told him that I have this grad student who is interested in working on this issue. Uh, there's this data set that you are using for your work. Can we bring you aboard to be part of his dissertation committee? So as part of that, later on, he got in touch with me. The World Bank staff got in touch with me. Francis, yeah, we're interested in, I'll be interested in working with you on your dissertation. But then I also have this uh, work I'm doing on Malawi. Will you be willing to, to work with me on that? Mm -hmm. And then through that, um, through that the consultancy work came up and then I signed up to that. And then after that, once I have that on my CV that I was a consultant for the bank, when I applied for a job, it became a little easier because I have some experience working with them. So right. it comes it comes with some of this, uh, you know, little initiatives, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I just you could just send an email to anybody and hopefully the, some will respond, some will not. But if they don't, don't give up. Yeah. And if you see any consultant's position online, just apply for it. And then if you see any position, apply for it. I mean, you have nothing to lose if you apply or if you send an email to somebody trying to establish a rapport or trying to establish um, a professional connection. You know, so that would be my advice, Albert. OK. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you. I, I think I think that that's very important. The trying to get a network, trying to connect with people, because ultimately people make decisions and people rather make bets with people they know than those that they don't know. All other factors held constant, like we say in economics. Uh, um, Francis, how do you see yourself? And, uh, having sort of an inverted view. Um, I know you talked about that Ronaldo guy who, could, who couldn't who could have achieved his full potential, if we can say that, because of the lack of opportunity. How do you see yourself um, being a part of, should I say, the new Africa, helping um, our village going back to our country maybe not literally, but using the skills to um, alleviate poverty or help people create opportunity. Do you, do you see yourself contributing to that agenda at all? And if you can talk about that very briefly, sort of to sort of close the loop on our conversation. Uh, yes, Albert, I, 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 th th this is a very interesting question. And uh, I believe, I, I'm somebody who believes in giving back to community because uh, personally, I, I benefited from somebody's uh, I, I benefited from an uncle's benevolence, mm -hmm. you know, so if my uncle had not helped me, I wouldn't have been able to come this far. So I feel like I owe society, I owe my family, I owe my village some kind of allegiance because of this. So <clears throat> what I'm planning on doing is uh, I, I have categorized that into three different aspects. The first one is at a very personal level, you know, using my own, my personal resources, going to my village to implement some projects to help you know, the, to help to educate the people in my village, you know, like maybe building a school or building a computer lab in my, in my, at my own personal level. Mm -hmm. And then helping them to, to basically see the essence of ed education and see the essence of uh, learning to, learning a trade, you know, th that would be a key way to helping people come out of poverty. But right. then, um, so that, that's the first part of it at, 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 at a very personal level. 
and then there is another uh, aspect of it that I'm thinking of, you know, like having an NGO that will mainly focus on, you know, going beyond my village, you know, to other communities in the neighborhood. Because, you know, as uh, no matter how much I'm earning, my, my resources are very limited. So I will need other resources and that will come in the way of the NGO, talking to organizations, talking to individuals to, to come together for us to, you know, have broader impact in my, in my community. But then at the, at the national level, I'm thinking about, um, you know, um, finding my way in the future. I foresee myself um, being part of Ghana's uh, cabinet okay. and then maybe at, at the ministerial level and then uh, using the knowledge that I acquire from my, um, from, from my current job or even future jobs that I obtain to be able to impact, you know, to be able to uh, put in place policies that will help transform my economy at a macro level. That, that's yeah. interesting. That's a, a very multi-layered systems perspective of mm -hmm. helping to to make the life of others better. And I, I think that um, you have taken the very first step in that process by agreeing to be a guest on on this on this um, podcast because uh, I I strongly believe that it is important that the stories of young Africans are amplified and that it's important that leadership is not seen as something for just the old but mm -hmm. as, as a place where different people learn from each other at perhaps even at the very early stage of their career because I think every story is important so um, I would want to thank you very much then Francis for spending your evening with us, uh, with myself and my audience. I think that the, the stories and the perspectives and the insights that you have shared will be um, very elucidating for people and also help them to um, help them to perhaps achieve their goals or learn some useful life lessons that would be that would be impactful. So thank you, Francis, um, for your time and thank you for making time to to join me today to talk about your work, international development, and the plans for the future. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Albert, for having me. I'm very grateful for the, for the opportunity, and uh, I, I I encourage you to keep doing this because I think it's very useful. A lot of people will learn from your podcasts, so I wish you the very best as you continue to do so. Thank you.